This is a presentation on a topic in criminal procedure in Victoria in the year 2013. The topic is search and seizure of evidential material. Now the ultimate question is whether the evidential material that was obtained was obtained lawfully because the real question is whether this evidential material will be admissible at trial. And if it's not admissible at trial, well, then a lot of time has been wasted and the question then arises of what can be done about it. So let's look at what uh, we need to consider when we are thinking about whether the evidential material was obtained lawfully. First question is whether the police were authorized to search the suspect and seize the items that are presented as evidential material. And I'm going to use the abbreviation D, it's just a lot more convenient, even though in Victoria we don't actually talk about the defendant anymore, we talk about the accused, but uh, using the abbrevi abbreviation S or A is more confusing than just uh, sticking to D, which a lot of people recognize. So were the police authorized to search the suspect and seize items? So let's start off with a scenario such as a public place. So let's say it was in a public place and they didn't have a warrant, they didn't have uh, any uh, paperwork justifying it. The question is really about genuine consent and we'll refer to the uh, case of Jameson. Um, now if it is pursuant to arrest, then uh, referring to the case of Davidson, there will be some uh, the consideration of whether the search and seizure were conducted prior to the arrest or pursuant to the arrest. And then there are, and even though at common law, uh, search and seizure is uh, strictly limited, we now have a number of statutes that empower the police to search people even if they are not suspected of a crime, even if it is not pursuant to an arrest. And we're going to look into all of those today. Uh, and that includes a stop and search provisions and a key consideration in all matters pertaining to search and seizure or the lawfulness of search and seizure is this notion of reasonable belief whether it was reasonable whether the police had a reasonable belief or reasonable suspicion or reasonable grounds for conducting a search and uh, consequently seizing those items so let's have a look at it in a bit more detail so the first question is whether there was a warrant issued for search and seizure. Now, if there was a warrant issued for search and seizure and the search and seizure were conducted in compliance, in accordance with the warrant, then uh, the search and seizure is authorized. That's what warrants are for. But let's say there was uh, no warrant issued. So uh, the first scenario we'll look at is whether there was a search and seizure without an arrest. So if there's search and seizure without an arrest, the question is whether it was conducted with genuine consent, not by, de not by deception, referred to the case of Jameson, and it's not allowed to be prior to arrest. So if you're going to, if the police are going to search someone that they suspect might have something on him or her, uh, they, the proper procedure is to arrest the person first and then conduct a search. You can't just, as a policeman, you can't just reach into someone's bag or rifle through someone's pockets. Um, and uh, the warrant doesn't necessarily have to be issued by a, a magistrate. In the case, in, in some cases, it can be uh, signed by uh, the, it can be signed by a senior police officer and we'll, we'll get into all of that. Now, if, if we get onto uh, the topic of illegal drugs, then we can refer to the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act, also abbreviated to the DPC, DPCSA. Uh, and if the police have a reasonable belief that the suspect has illegal drugs or related items uh, in his possession or in the vehicle, etc., then the police have the authority pursuant to section 82 of this act to search any person, vehicle, boat, aircraft, animal in a public place uh, and 
if they find anything, seize any drug of dependence or instrument suspected to have been used in the manufacture thereof. And now a question arose in the case of uh, DPP and against Derby in 2002, New South Wales, whether using a sniffer dog is a form of search. And it was held that using a sniffer dog is not a search in itself, so it's not an unlawful search to consent or neither consent nor warrant nor any other kind of authorization is needed. Uh, but an alert by sniffer dog, so the sniffer dog going up to you and wagging his tail, whatever the sniffer dogs do, can give rise to a reasonable belief. Sorry, reasonable belief. I'll just fix that. Uh, thereby justifying a search. Moving on. So let's say we're not talking about drugs, let's say we're talking about a prohibited weapon. So similarly, pursuant to the Controlled Weapons Act 1990, Section 10, uh, the, uh, it may be asked whether the police have a reasonable suspicion that the suspect has a prohibited weapon in his position in a public place. Um, so if he has uh, a knife or a gun or whatever on him, then uh, the police have the authority to search the suspect's person uh, or the suspect's car uh, or really anything uh, in the suspect's control. And you can see why I switched to the abbreviation D because it looks a bit silly with SS. And uh, also under the Crimes Act 1958 section 469A if there's reasonable belief of a prohibited weapon then the police are empowered not only to search the suspect's person and his car, but uh, you, uh, but to apprehend him and uh, and search him uh, when he's on board an aircraft or about to board an aircraft. So, special provision, uh, someone trying to get out of the country, uh, Section Four Six Nine A allows the police to nab that person who is suspected of having something naughty on him. And by naughty we mean a prohibited. In addition to these two statutes, the Controlled Weapons Act and the um, DPCSA 1981, there are also stop and search provisions uh, such as the control under the Controlled Weapons Act 1990, which permits the police to designate uh, areas, to have these planned or unplanned designated areas where basically it's, it's like if there's a big public event uh, if you go to the city during New Year's, for instance, and certain areas are cordoned off, the police basically have the authority to uh, search you for uh, just about anything under the sun. So they can search a person, the, the, a suspect's person, or his vehicle, request ID, detain that person for as long as is necessary, and uh, certainly uh, confiscate uh, anything that is considered a weapon pursuant to Section 3 of the Controlled Weapons Act 1990, so it would be a prohibited weapon, a controlled weapon, or a dangerous article. So really anything that they consider is a weapon, it's, it's pretty broad. Uh, but if you're not in a uh, designated area, then the police, then the usual rules uh, apply. Then the police would have to refer to one of these statutes, or uh, they wouldn't really have the authority unless they got some authorization like a search warrant. So that's uh, what. So that's basically search and seizure um, when we're not talking about arrest. Now let's say we are talking about uh, search and seizure pursuant to an arrest. Well, there are um, from the common law there are three main reasons, or three main justifications for seizing items once you've uh, arrested someone, and uh, they are whether uh, you can seize items that are basically evidential material of an offence. You can, as a police, you can seize uh, weapons or implements which could be used to escape, and you can also seize something that uh, the suspect could use to harm himself or someone else. So if it's uh, evidence, if it's uh, dangerous, or if it can be used to escape, then it's uh, perfectly lawful to search and and seize that item. Now there was a, 
uh, now there are some things that uh, have gone to court that, um, uh, that were held not to be reasonably seized or justifiably seized and again let's let's just revisit the three points reasonably connected to a crime could be used to cause injury or tools which could aid in escape uh, if it's um, in in a couple of cases Lindley against Rutter 1979 um, a woman was arrested and jewellery was forcibly removed from her person to which she violently objected. It was held that that was not reasonable in, um, oh sorry, that was, uh, I'll start again. So the case of Lindy and Rutter, she was arrested for drunk and disor uh, for disorderly conduct and also assault, so she was quite violent and drunk. They tried to remove her bra, she uh, attacked the policewoman who tried to remove the bra was held to be not reasonable for the circumstances. Uh, similarly, in the case of the Crown against Naylor, um, removing jewellery for uh, ostensible safekeeping was not reasonable. And also, it's very important to bear in mind that not only does the policeman or policewoman have to arrest the person prior to conducting a search and seizing seizure of items, but a reason for the search has to be provided as well. And the police, in the case of Brazil against Chief Constable of Surrey in 1983, failed to provide a reason for the search of, of Miss Brazil's person, and that was held to be unlawful as well. Uh, now, returning to this case of this point of search and seizure pursuant to arrest, that is the emphasis is on pursuant and not prior in the case of Davidson, uh, Crown against Davidson in South Australia. Uh, Davidson was driving a car, the police pulled her over and they suspected that she might have drugs in her handbag. Uh, they basically pulled her over, they didn't arrest her, they just reached in, grabbed her handbag and found uh, I think a syringe. Not sure if they did find drugs or not but uh, it went, it, it was appealed and uh, it was held that the correct procedure is to arrest her if they have reasonable grounds for believing that she has, uh, has drugs on her and then to search her person and her belongings, not to reach through the car window, grab a handbag and rifle through it to find evidence of what they might have suspected. So remember search and seizure pursuant with the emphasis on pursuant to arrest and that's uh, pretty much it for search and seizure in a public place without a warrant let's return to the main map yes save okay so let's say that uh, we're talking about uh, not a public place, uh, basically in someone's in someone's home. Uh, the premises of the uh, of the the uh, suspect. So then, we first want to look at whether the both the entry and the search and seizure were authorized. So, let's have a look at this topic of the warrant. Uh, a warrant for entry, search and seizure. And uh, they're quite, it's governed these days by quite a few different acts and uh, it's worth going through them just to pick out some of the salient uh, uh, differentiations. Now, basically as a, as a legal principle, you can take it that if there's a warrant for search and seizure of items uh, from the suspect's premises, it necessarily includes authority to enter, and that usually means authority to enter by force if necessary. Um, that's that's what warrants are there for. So let's start with this question of stolen goods. All right. So if if the police want a warrant to search the premises and the person of the suspect uh, for stolen goods or evidence thereof there are two authorities who can issue such a warrant. One is a magistrate, the other is a, is a, is a police uh, 
is a policeman of the rank of inspector or above pursuant to section 92 subsection 2 of the Crimes Act um, but the the inspector the, the, the policeman who isn't the, the issuing authority that is not the magistrate um, has uh, can only do so if it is on, uh, if the suspect was convicted within the last five years of either handling stolen goods or of some other imprisonable offence involving dishonesty. So, generally speaking, if uh, for uh, if it's not someone who's who's known who has a who has a criminal record of uh, theft or robbery or burglary or whatever, then uh, they have to go to the magistrate. And there's a very particular procedure which is that the magistrate, uh, the the police officer submitting the request for a warrant has to provide either an oath or a signed affidavit uh, which uh, satisfies the issuing authority and in this oath or signed affidavit the police officer, police officer has to convey a reasonable cause for the belief uh, that the stolen that there are stolen goods in uh, the suspect's possession at the suspect's premises or in the suspect's vehicle. Now, assuming uh, now, in the case of uh, Jameson, two thousand and three, basically what happened was the uh, the police uh, went to Jameson's house. They uh, quickly dis uh, spotted uh, some some very suspicious uh, items: a car with its bonnet open. And policemen walked over and saw that the engine number had been filed away and a few other things. So they immediately uh, start initiated the process of getting search warrants, uh, but that process was was not completed. And when it went to trial, uh, basically they had all this evidential material that they wanted the court to admit, but uh, it came to light that the uh, evidential material had not been obtained according to lawful procedure. Ultimately, it was admitted. Uh, because uh, on the grounds that this was this would not trigger uh, serious public policy considerations, and the um, and the reasoning that we may take from this is, uh, to put it in positive terms, if the uh, if the evidential material was obtained, uh, uh, if the search uh, had major or intentional irregularities. Uh, then it may not be admitted on grounds of public policy considerations. Conversely, if the search is marred by minor and unintentional irregularities, as was the case here, the police genuinely thought that the, the search warrants had been obtained and the irregularities of, of, the, of their procedure were, were minor and unintentional, then the evidence was admissible, and we'll review this at the end of the presentation. And um, so assuming that it was all done correctly here with respect to the procedure, then it's very important to remember that section nine, that a warrant issued pursuant to section 92 of the Crimes Act gives the police the authority to enter and search premises for stolen goods only. Stolen goods only. If the police want a more comprehensive search warrant. Ah, one other thing is that uh, the Victorian Police Manual uh, indicates that uh, going to the inspector or above should be used only in urgent circumstances either um, and if it's not the most urgent circumstances then they should go the usual route of, of applying to a magistrate. So that's uh, just a note for the, for the Victorian police. So the police are within their rights to get a warrant from an inspector or above pursuant to section 92, subsection 2, but the police manual um, uh, advises them against that unless it's very, very uh, urgent. So if the police want a, uh, a, a, a more comprehensive warrant, a warrant that allows them to search for more than stolen goods, then they have to obtain a warrant by uh, by means of the provisions of the Crimes Act section 465, which is uh, which is 
going to provide them with authority to enter and search the premises for evidence of any indictable offence. And how do they obtain it? Well, it can be issued by a senior sergeant or above, and there has to be a submission um, of either evidence or an oath or signed affidavit conveying a reasonable belief that um, evidential material is to be found in a building, a receptacle or place within the next 72 hours, that uh, uh, that, uh, that evidences one of the following, either that an indictable offence has been committed or that they're going to find something there that would afford commission of an indictable offence or they're going to find something there that's evidence that uh, an um, of something that is intended to be used to commit an indictable offence. So, um, in the case of the Crown against Borg, what happened was Borg was suspected of, of murder. Uh, the police uh, uh, obtained a search warrant, but it turned out that the affidavit used to request the search warrant had not been signed, uh, so the search uh, warrant, um, the search warrant was therefore illegally obtained and then the DPP had the unenviable, unenviable task of convincing the court that the desirability of admitting this um, unlawfully obtained evidential material outweighed the desirability, presumably public policy considerations, of not admitting this unlawfully obtained material and this and the the courts uh, have this discretion pursuant to the Evidence Act section 138 subsection 3 which allows admission of illegally obtained evidence obviously at the court's discretion and in this case uh, Justice Lazary did apply section 138 subsection 3 of the Evidence Act and did admit the um, unlawfully obtained evidential material as evidence at the trial and we will return to that at the end of the presentation. Let's assume that we're moving on, assume that we're talking about drugs, illegal drugs. Well, that's governed by uh, the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981, Section 81. And to obtain that, the police have to go to a sergeant or above. They have to admit an evident, uh, they have to make a submission by evidence, oath or signed affidavit conveying a reasonable belief that within the next 72 hours, either some illegal some drug offen related offence is to be committed or that they'll find evidential material i.e. drugs or drug, some drug manufacturing instruments uh, or documents, uh, basically receipts or documents uh, evidencing transactions to do with drug trade. So burrowing into section 81 of the DPCSA section 81 subsection 3 uh, allows for a warrant of with a one month expiry. Uh, subsection B empowers the police to arrest all the persons on the premises when they enter the premises. Uh, subsection C allows them to search all the persons, vehicles, boats, etc. So whatever they, whatever's there, they can search it. And D authorizes them to seize any evidential material that they, that they obtain in that, that they find in that way. Moving on, let's say we're talking about prohibited weapons. Well, that's pursuant to the Control of Weapons Act 1990, Section 11. Uh, there, the police have to go to a sergeant or above, again, make a submission by evidence, oath or signed affidavit, conveying a reasonable belief that they're going to find prohibited weapons at their premises. Um, importantly, or maybe for uh, historical interest, this uh, warrant gives the police the power to enter any time, day or night, uh, which overrules the, the, the common law tradition that uh, the police are um, authorised only to go during the day, not to break into someone's house at night. Uh, this allows them to go in at any time and to use force if necessary to get into the place and they have the power to search the premises, search the persons, search everything that they find and seize prohibited weapons. Finally, if um, if it's none of the above, but it is a, it is to do with a graffiti offence, then the police officer making the submission has to provide reasonable grounds to the magistrate for suspicion of evidential material 
pertain, uh, relating to a graffiti offence um, on the premises that he's asking for a warrant, uh, he's asking the magistrate to issue a warrant for. And the search warrant must identify the following, the alleged offence, the premises to be searched, articles, etc., for which the search is made, and conditions to which the warrant is subject, and whether entry is authorised to be made at any time or during stated hours, and finally, a day not later than seven days after the issue of the warrant on which the warrant ceases to have effect. So for a warrant um, pursuant to the Graffiti Act, Section 12, uh, it's only going to have a seven-day expiry as opposed to, for instance, the illegal drugs warrant, which has a, a one-month expiry. So one month for illegal drugs and uh, one week for graffiti offences. Right, so that's, um, that's basically what it takes to, to get a warrant. Now, let's say that uh, a warrant has been obtained and we uh, and our, our friendly police uh, barge in and they find some stuff. But let's say they find these uh, items uh, inadvertently. So let's say there's a warrant for, uh, for arrest for one offence, let's say uh, some kind of driving charge, and they come in and they find uh, something else like drugs. Well, referring to the common law, um, if it's a genuinely inadvertent discovery, and uh, there is, pursuant to Crimes Act Section 459A, a reasonable belief that the person you walk in on is committing a serious indictable offence or has committed an offence elsewhere that would be a serious indictable offence in Victoria or has escaped from legal custody, then seizure of whatever uh, the police officer walks in on is authorised, otherwise it's not. But uh, a warrant uh, that doesn't explicitly give the police the authority to search everything and everyone does not justify a general search, and that's backed up by the precedent of three cases, uh, Crown against Appleby in 95, Ludwig against Public Trustee in 2006, and the Crown against Rigney Hopkins in 2005. So it's very important for the police who get a search warrant for drugs or for prohibited weapons or whatever, that uh, they can only seize what the warrant gives them permission to seize um, unless in the course of conducting a search for X, they genuinely, inadvertently discover Y. But let's say it's not an inadvertent discovery, but they walk in and they have a reasonable suspicion that some illegal drug activity is going on, then, pursuant to Section 81 of the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act, uh, they have the authority to seize potential evidential materials. So if the police walk, uh, walk into a house or enter a house with a warrant for some, something uh, else and they walk into a room and it's basically a drugs lab, then they have the authority pursuant to uh, this legislation, uh, Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981, Section 81, to go ahead and seize this potential evidential material. So that's uh, entry, search and seizure authorised by a warrant. But let's say we've got entry, search and seizure that's not authorised by a warrant. So they enter some, the police enter someone's house, someone's premises, but there isn't a warrant uh, to uh, authorise that entry. Well, if the police want to enter the premises without a warrant, then either they're going to have to obtain genuine consent, or they have to have a reasonable belief that uh, we're talking about a serious indictable offence. So if we're looking at genuine consent, they have to obtain the consent of the person to enter the premises, and it can't be by deception, referring to the Jameson case, and if the, uh, if, if the argument is made that uh, consent was obtained by deception, then the onus 
of proving consent is on the prosecution, uh, but it's only on the balance of probabilities, uh, referring to the case of the Crown against Mice in 1987. It's also uh, worth bearing in mind that uh, the common law does provide the police with an implied license to enter up to the front door, referring to the case of Halliday, um, Halliday and Neville, uh, Halliday and Neville, 1984. But it can, but this implied license to enter can be expressly revoked, and if the uh, police remain on the property for any unreasonable amount of time, it uh, quickly becomes trespass, and that was seen in the case of Plenty and Dillon, 1991, and Robson and Hallett, 1967. But let's, uh, if the police do obtain the consent, the uh, occupier of the premises uh, has the right to revoke the consent. This consent is revocable at any time, and um, if he revokes his consent, then he must give the police a reasonable amount of time to leave, but that usually isn't a very long time. Now, uh, it's not very clear to me uh, if the consent is not revoked, how long a reasonable time is for the police to remain, but uh, I'm sure that that uh, would be examined uh, within the circumstances of, of the case, and uh, I haven't come across any cases where there's a complaint of the police hanging around someone's house for an unreasonable amount of time. And uh, to return to the Crimes Act, if the police do have a reasonable belief that, um, pursuant to section 459A, that the uh, suspect is committing a serious indictable offence or has committed an offence elsewhere that would be a serious indictable offence in Victoria or is escaping leave custody, then they have the authority to use force to gain entry if necessary. And if it's none of that, then they have no authority to enter the man's home, is his castle, etc., etc. All right. <coughs> so... If we have, so if both entry and search and seizure are authorised, then, um, oh, let's say both entry and search and seizure are not authorised, well then we went over the inadvertent discovery without a warrant, and um, the common law, uh, the co there is also a common law basis for allowing the police to uh, to seize material that they don't have a warrant for. So there are two scenarios. One is they have a warrant for something else, and the other is that they don't have a warrant uh, at all. And um, in the case of Ghani and Jones, 1970, basically conditions were, were worked out as to when it's acceptable, when it's not acceptable, when it's admissible, not admissible. So if there's a reasonable, le reasonable belief that um, a serious offence is to be committed or has been committed, etc., if there's a reasonable belief on the part of the police that the item they seize is the fruit of a crime or an instrument to be used, such as instrument for the manufacture of drugs or some other form of material evidence of, a, of an offence, uh, that's acceptable. But the police uh, have to keep the item for no longer than necessary for the investigation. And an important point is that the lawfulness of the police officer's conduct is decided at the time, not by the consequences. So they can't engage in unlawful conduct and uh, then say, but, and, and then argue after the fact that uh, this unlawful conduct enabled them to obtain important evidence. That the, the courts do have the discretion to choose this, if, uh, um, but the, the, com the common law position from Carney and Jones is that uh, the police uh, should not do that. And that was applied in Goldberg and Brown 2003 and also in Greer against Commissioner of Police New South Wales 2002. But it was challenged, or was criticised rather, in Challenge Plastics and Collective Customs 1993. All right, <clears throat> so let's say the police were authorised to search the suspect and seize items. The next 
question is whether the type of search conducted is authorised. Now, in Victoria, as far as I understand, there's no specification of authorised types of search, but it is, uh, it is uh, listed in the Crimes Act 1914 of the Commonwealth, uh, the, the Commonwealth Crimes Act, uh, rather than Victorian Crimes Act, which is 1958. And I just had a little think about why we don't have these procedural provisions in Victoria, and it might be that uh, stipulating when a strip search is permissible might be rather inconvenient politically, and seeing as it's already in the Crimes Act um, and gives the, gives the police plenty of, of latitude in that regard, uh, it's probably politically inadvisable to pass any legislation to that effect. But that's just my conjecture. At any rate, uh, to work out whether a certain kind of search is permitted, we refer to section 3ZE, 3ZF, 3ZH. 3ZG is about uh, searching someone's car. So 3ZE, F, and H. So the three kinds of search, and we'll go into each of those because what's required uh, varies quite a bit. So the first kind of search is just a frisk search, just your friendly frisking your sides and pockets and possibly your crotch, uh, but only very lightly. And uh, it's quite simple. The police officer has to have a reasonable suspicion of evidential material or seizable item, and the police officer has to argue, be able to argue that it was prudent to conduct a frisk search to ascertain the possession thereof. And if so, then Section 3ZE of the Commonwealth Crimes Act permits the police police officer to do so. Um, but let's say we're not talking about a frisk search, let's say we're just talking about an ordinary search, then, um, which I think is a bit more extensive. Again, same, same conditions, reasonable suspicion of evidential material or seizable item, and prudency. But the interesting type of search is uh, strip search, whether there's authorization for a strip search, because obviously that's uh, a much hotter topic. Well, first of all, they can't argue, the police officer cannot argue that there was reasonable suspicion of forensic evidential material. Authorization for obtaining forensic evidential material has to be got elsewhere, so not authorized. But if there's reasonable suspicion of ev evidential material of, a, of an offense uh, or a seizable item, uh, and it is reasonable to conduct a strip search in order to ascertain possession thereof, and there is authorization from a superintendent or higher, then strip search is authorized. And that's sec uh, Commonwealth Crimes Act section 3ZH. So if we go up to our little summary here, there are three points for strip search, and that's the one that's probably of most interest in, in uh, legal studies. First of all, reasonable suspicion of evidential material that's not forensic or a seizable item. Secondly, reasonable suspicion that a strip search is necessary in order to uh, ascertain whether, these, uh, whether this item or material is on the person. And finally, most importantly, is whether there is authorization from a superintendent or higher. And if uh, all of those boxes are ticked, then there is authorization for a frisk search, ordinary search, or strip search, whatever may be the case. So we've, we've gone along and we found uh, that the police officers were authorized to search the suspect and seize items, and they complied with the procedure for, um, uh, as, as far as the type of search is concerned. Um, but let's say, uh, and now if, if those two things are true, then we've got evidential material which is admissible trial. But let's say <coughs> the police did not obtain, were not authorized to search the suspect and seize items, or did not comply with the procedures uh, of, of the uh, authorization for the kind of search that they engaged in, uh, usually strip search I suppose. Well, then the evidential material may not be admissible at trial. But there is 
one caveat, an important caveat, which is the Evidence Act, as I mentioned before, section 138, subsection 3, which does give the court the discretion to decide whether the desirability of admitting the illegally obtained evidence outweighs the desirability of not admitting it. And when can we make an educated guess as to whether illegally obtained evidence is going to be uh, admitted, or ev illegally obtained evidential material is going to be admitted as evidence? Well, the first question might be whether there is irregular, whether the irregularity in the search was minor and unintentional, as in the case of Jameson, where it was admitted. Uh, that, if you recall, that's when the police failed to uh, obtain search warrants and they seized uh, stolen goods and it was and they were obviously stolen goods and all of that sort of stuff and it was held in that case that that evidential material should be admitted as evidence because it didn't really trigger any public policy concerns. So there is precedent for admitting evidential material if the irregularity in search be minor and unintentional. But if we're not talking about something like the Jameson case, then another possi possible uh, instance of, of admission of illegally obtained evidential material is whether the seriousness of the crime and the nature of the evidence obtained weigh heavily in favour of admitting the evidential material. The precedent there is the case of Borg, where, as we said before, the police, offers, the police officers failed to sign the affidavits, they obtained evidential material, the DPP had the unenviable task of convincing the court that it was very desirable, overwhelmingly desirable, to admit the evidence, and ultimately Justice Lasry agreed with the department, with the DPP, and applied section 138, subsection 3 of the Evidence Act and admitted that evidential material as evidence. But if it's neither if it's if it's neither very serious evidence for a very serious crime, uh, nor um, obvious evidence obtained by means of a search marred by minor and unintentional irregularities, then uh, it's unlikely to be admitted as evidence. So remember, with just about everything in criminal procedure, we are basically talking about uh, whether something is going to be admitted in, ev in evidence or whether the whatever happens at trial is, is, is correct, uh, it follows the procedure, and um, all of the other questions really flow from that. So the ultimate question when talking about evidential material arising from search and seizure is whether the evidential material will be admissible at trial. And if it's not prima facie admissible at trial, is there some way that the DPP can convince the, um, the, the court that this, uh, that this material, this evidential material, should be admitted as evidence. So uh, that's my presentation on criminal on search and seizure of evidential material in Victorian criminal procedure in the year 2013. I hope this presentation has uh, helped you to get your head around this rather tricky, finicky topic. And uh, feel free to leave comments down below and let me know if this has helped you. And of course, check out my blog, tabulalex.blogspot.com. Thanks for watching.